Hello everyone and welcome back to my descent into madness that I call hand sewing 18th century stays. And it's not like I haven't done this before, I just keep choosing to do incredibly complex options every single time. In fact, I've hand sewn myself five pairs of stays before, and it's not like I don't know what I'm getting myself into. I know just how challenging this sort of project is and how much time it takes. I just wanted to challenge myself more for some reason. So the pair that I ended up using for inspiration, if you haven't seen the video looking at the materials and design process and the patterning, highly recommend going and checking that out. But it is from the Bankfield Museum, which is part of the Halifax Museum system. And all of the information on this particular pair of stays comes from the Handbound Costumes website. So the link for that is below if you want more from them or more information on this pair of stays. But this pair particularly interested me because it was going to be a challenge because there is so much in it that I didn't fully understand or didn't know how it was going to turn out and I wanted to do something different. Of course that means that I am now a good solid 50 hours plus into sewing this and I am nowhere near finished so hopefully by the time this video comes out in a few days I will have completed this entire project but there is still a lot of work to be done which of course means a lot of sitting and sewing for incredibly long hours. I did get a lot of questions in the previous video about how I managed to do that without actually hurting myself or ending up with carpal tunnel and historically a lot of it simply comes down to posture and how you're seated. In the 18th century, stays were made by tailors and they actually sat on top of the table in order to keep their work clean, but that meant that they sat cross-legged or what is called tailor style in a lot of places in the world still, and they would put a board on top of their knees if they needed to for a flat surface, and that gives them a really good curve in the spine that keeps you from wearing out. And this is how I sit the majority of the time when I'm working on stays. I will occasionally sit in a chair at a table at a good height to make sure that I'm sitting upright, not hunched over. But honestly, I find it so much less comfortable than sitting on a floor or a bench cross-legged and working on a board. That for some reason works so much better for me. Now that doesn't mean that I'm not worn out by this and it doesn't mean that I'm not taking a ton of breaks and making sure that I get enough rest. In fact, that is one of the reasons why I am so glad that the sponsor for this video is Brooklinen. If you're looking for high quality home goods, Brooklinen has luxury sheets and home essentials, all without the luxury price markup. I've actually been buying my sheets and towels from Brooklinen for almost a decade. I first came across them when I was looking for better quality options that would actually last. Natural fibers and good quality textile have always been an important part of my life when I'm awake, so it makes sense for the other third of my life when I'm not. I'm absolutely in love with their linen sheets for that reason. They help to regulate temperature at night, they are so incredibly soft, and only get better with every wash. And they have so many different options when it comes to style. You can mix and match all sorts of colors and patterns. I got the Hardcore Bundle, which not only has the core sheet set, but also extra pillowcases and a duvet cover, and you save 25% over individual items that way. Then you can have fun creating a distinct style for your bedroom. I love changing mine out for the seasons. I know it's only early September, but I can pretend it's autumn. And right now, Brooklinen is having their Labor Day sale, so all Brooklinen items are 20% off through September 6th. As we're cozying into fall, take advantage of the sale to get yourself some luxurious sheets. Thanks again to Brooklinen for sponsoring this week's video, so that way I can manage through this absolutely massive project. Because frankly, there's not only a lot of stitching in this pair of stays, but there's also a lot of problem solving. I wanted to take a look at the original before I dove into my construction, so that way I'm not constantly going back and having to show you photos of what I'm talking about because some of these things are a little weird. Starting off in the center front, you'll notice that it has lacing halfway down the front. This is set in permanently. This is meant to give the right shape, which has a lot of bow and thrust to the front. So this is not meant to be something that adjusts in and out. In fact, the ribbon is actually stitched into the binding, which is also just stitched fully across. But it's important to note here that there is a piece of fabric that is backing the open space. It's not left bare and that the lacing goes around this. So clearly this piece is inset before the eyelets are done and the ribbon is set in. There's also a busk behind this and we'll be figuring that out as we get further along how to put the busk in with the pocket. It does seem to be permanently set in, which is a little bit different than the early 19th century busks that we're used to. So this will be a little bit of a different process. There's also a horizontal bone that runs across the interior. We'll talk more about that when we get to it. As we come across to that front side seam, you'll notice that the boning actually stops about half an inch before it gets into the armpit area. So I'll need to make sure that I adjust the boning to be that length 
appropriately. Going down to the bottom of that angled side piece now, it is notable that the boning changes angles as we get down to the tabs, which means that though we can't see it, those tabs are actually running underneath the other boning, which means that I need to add on another layer in that area. So we're going to be talking about how to add in the gusset in the front, how to add in a busk, how to add in a horizontal bone, how to add in multiple layers of crisscrossed boning, which is really common as the 1770s and 80s come in with the half bone styles and the lighter weight bonings. So this is something that is really important to look for, even though we don't see that that boning crosses under necessarily. There's just enough of a shadow there though that implies that it does. In the very back there are the offset eyelets, which allow for spiral lacing. They are a much heavier stitch than the front eyelets, which only have maybe three or four stitches per each. These are fully covered. There's a little bit of funkiness up at the top where the boning channels end into the piece that will connect to be the shoulder strap. I'm personally doing a seamed on shoulder strap just because it saves on fabric and it makes it a little bit less stressful for me to get the angle of it right since I'm fitting this on myself. So that will be a little bit different than the original. But the main thing that I'm taking away from this original is the boning pattern because it is really unusual. It's a very lightweight boning. It has a lot of complex angles. And this pair of stays comes from an era where a lot of stays are half boned or very lightly boned instead. So it's interesting that they chose to go with this method instead. And I'm really curious to see what it looks like differently on the body, how it provides support more or less, all of those things. But those are all of the notes that I've carried for myself from the original pair into the construction methods that I'm going to be showing you and problem solving and talking about. So be sure to keep those images in mind as I'm going through and talking about the process of stitching, which for me starts with laying out the pattern pieces because I've already made the buckram in the previous video. So I am ready to get going. I'm starting off with cutting out of just the buckram. I'm cutting two layers at the same time and I'm drawing out the shape, but I'm giving myself a huge amount of seam allowance on this, usually about an inch around most of the edges. Some of the things are a little bit narrower just because I don't want to waste a bunch of fabric, but I'm just doing a very, very rough cut. I'll trim things down once I get close to the very end. So once I have the rough cut of the buckram, I cut out the silk as well. So that way I have stacks of three, two layers of buckram, one layer of the main fabric, and then I will make a very precise tracing of the pattern and go around and baste through all three layers in order to hold them together and give myself a very precise line that I'm going to be working with. So I'll do that for every single one of the pieces, making sure that I have a right and a left for every single one of them. That is a very important part of the process. And then I can go and start working on marking out the boning. I add little holes to my patterns in order to make sure that I can mark out where the intersections occur. And this will keep me on track. I mark some of the boning channels at the top and bottom that are a little bit weird, but honestly, I'm kind of trusting that I'm able to do the same distance over and over again once I get a visual for it. And the points are there to make sure that I'm matching things up correctly as I go. And some of the angles are a little weird. So you can do as much or as little here as you want in order to get your boning channels consistent. I am then going in and pad stitching essentially, but with basting thread, the entirety of the pieces together. This holds everything as we're going to work because as you start to work, these things will want to shift. Whether you're doing it by machine or by hand, the layers are going to want to move around. So I've added a bunch of vertical layers of the pad stitching and a few horizontal. And then it's time to get started on the actual channels. I am not using knots in my thread because this turns into a princess in the pea situation and it gets really bulky and bumpy really fast. So I'm anchoring my thread tail and then making a couple loops and then starting my stitching. I'm also going right up to the edge with these, but not any further when it comes to the final edges. I will go further then with the seam allowances, however. So you can go a few stitches further where we're going to actually put the seams, which is a good idea in case you need to adjust things a little bit later. But I'm doing a pretty small back stitch, but you can do a much bigger back stitch. At the end, I again knot off and anchor. If I am continuing on to the next boning channel because it's right next to it, I just simply slip the tail across under just one layer of the buckram, making sure not to catch both, and start immediately on the next boning channel. It's good, whether you're working by machine or hand, to go back and forth alternate what direction you're working from. So that way it's not all drying it down one way. 
that is a very useful thing for all stays and corsets. I'm also doing a few anchoring channels before I really get into the bulk of it. I've spread them out so that way it's a few varied around holding things into place so that way as I work channel by channel I'm not gradually getting further and further off and have to correct that. I have points that are stable and done ahead of time before things start to skew. So again recommend no matter which way you're doing boning channels because honestly the only reason I'm doing them by hand is because I want to do that because I like the visual of it and to show you guys. That is the only reason. Otherwise, machine is perfectly fine for this. And the reason why hand is not always the best option is because, frankly, this probably took me a good 60 hours to do all of the boning channels. There are almost 250 bones in this pair of stays, and that is a lot of stitching. And in case you do want to see hour upon hour of me stitching these boning channels, I'm actually going to be putting up a much longer, more uh, atmospheric video on my other channel. So if you want a couple hours of study time or work time along with me, go check that out over there. When it comes to this side piece on an angle, I'm only doing the upper portion of the boning channels and then I'm going to start slowly boning it before I get to those tabs. Because they are overlapped, I'm going to need to add another layer of buckram to the back side for these tabs. But in stitching the channels for those, I will move from the front to the back that I don't want to accidentally go through more layers than I'm supposed to. I will close up the other channels, which is a terrible idea. So I'm doing a few bones in that first set and then I'm laying out linen on top of it in a strip that is wide enough to catch all the boning channels. I did attempt to use a bead of linen for this. I found I don't really like it once I got the bones into it. So stick with the buckram. I was just trying to not waste what I thought was not enough buckram, but I did have enough. And I'm starting with the longest edge of that one tab. So I have four tabs here, and this is the longest edge of the shortest tab. And I want to start with that longest one because it's going to give me the most consistent line already drawn out as far as possible. Just means that as I get up to that top where we're working on the back side and I don't have the channels drawn out in the same way, I found it's kind of easy to get a little bit off left or right and then you end up with a problem. So if you have the longest correct guaranteed line starting, it makes it a little bit easier. I'm only going past about three bones in order to anchor the back of this. It doesn't need to go really far into the piece, it just needs to go far enough that those edges won't pop out and it will keep the tab from being floppy. So just three or so bones. As you can see, once we move to that back side, we're just kind of doing a back stitch, space back stitch. It's pretty rough. And you'll get all those channels in and they will just continue up over the interior. And then making sure that everything's working with inserting those little bones there. And you can see it kind of holds nicely and doesn't flip around. And this gets repeated with every single one of them. With this particular design, I found that the first two tabs needed just those bones in the very front. Then at that point I could add in the next set of bones and repeat, repeat for the other two tabs. There's also a little bit of extra security stitching done across horizontally, just above where the splits occur. This seems another pretty common thing. Not only are there about five or six back stitches done between each section, there's also some little spaced back stitches working their way up. There's variations on this across lots of different stays. I don't know if it's functional as much as it is decorative. I can see arguments for both, but honestly, it just looks nice and I'm trying to better understand why everything's done that way. Once we've gotten all of the regular boning channels in, then it's time to work on the center back. This is one case where it's pretty common that a spaced back stitch is used. I went ahead and pressed over the edge. I gave myself a little bit of extra space just because when you're folding, the channel tends to get a little bit smaller than how you've marked it. Then it's time to do seaming. Again, pressing back all those edges. This is also a point where I might trim them back just a little bit because the curves sometimes can make it difficult if it's over an inch. So I'm trimming it back to about three quarters of an inch just to make sure that in case I need to adjust things, I have the space to do it. And I'm pinning them right side to right side. I'm kind of weaving the pins in vertically in order to get through that bulk because there is a lot of bulk here. I'm then working with a double heavy thread. This could be linen or silk. And I'm starting off at the top, about a quarter of an inch down from the top. And I'm working in diagonals. So we're spiraling. And I spiral up two stitches which will then get me to the very edge. 
and it sort of locks off that space, and then I will start spiraling my way down through the rest of the stays. So that locks over that top edge rather than dealing with a knot or hoping that whatever I did to anchor it to begin with really holds, I've looped back over myself. And this is the point where, yeah, this is gonna be a little tedious, a a little dense in terms of the stitching, but you really want the strength here. This is the one place that I highly recommend, even if you are machine stitching everything else in your stays, that you do this by hand because it is such a strong stitch. And I have seen machine sewing split, no matter whether you double up your lines or not, it's just such a high stress point. So whip over the edges like this instead, and once you've finished with each, open it up flat and it gives you a very strong sturdy stitch that will last through a lot of wear and tear. The front since it split open I had to wait until I seamed it together down at the bottom in order to put the final stitches in for the last boning channel but just like the back boning channel make sure you've given yourself enough space to roll over that boning and then it's time to put all of your boning in. You can do this before you assemble the pieces I just find it easier to do after everything is seamed together. I know it's not technically how historically it was often done. They would put all the boning in and then they would whip over the seam allowances and then they would put the pieces together. I just find this to be a lot easier for a number of reasons, such as the boning channels that end into the seam and but don't have stitching to hold them in. Either way, I'm working with German plastic whalebone, which means that it is really easy to cut with a pair of scissors just make sure it's not your nice fabric scissors. And once I cut each edge to the right angle, I'm just clipping back so that way there's not sharp points. You can take the time to file every single one of these down so they're smoother, which could mean that you're less likely to have a bone bust through in long-term wear. But honestly, uh, with 248 of these, I'm not bothering. If you have trouble getting the bones into the channels, I highly recommend having a pair of needle nose pliers nearby to help with that. Once everything is in, I need to put a little anchoring stitch half an inch down from the top edge where the bones don't extend all the way to the top. So around the armpit area and up to the back, there's a half inch gap there, which is one of the reasons why I was measuring out the bones on top rather than just sticking them into the channels and cutting them as is. So I need to add that in there to hold them into place. And then I'm able to move on to the beginning portion of the eyelets. I have a lot of these to do. The back ones are where I'm starting. So that way I can actually try this pair of stays on. I like working the all back and forth from front and back a few times just to open up everything really well. We're not punching a hole. That is the big rule here. Do not punch a hole. If you simply open a hole with an awl, it will hold itself even when your stitching goes. Nothing's going to rip out, tear out. You're building up a bulk of threads there. So all I then have to do is take a double or a single silk thread, linen thread, whatever you're using, and work around the eyelet. You don't need to do a fancy stitch here. They're not doing a buttonhole stitch. They're just whipping over the edge. And you can go really dense or you can go really not dense. There are some that only have about four stitches holding them open, which is actually what we will end up doing in the center front when we get near to the end of this project. And one of the more interesting things here is that they will knot off at the back and then carry over to the next eyelet, as you can see, so that way you're not breaking your thread between each one. I definitely find that it does speed up the process a little bit. Then it's time to split open the tabs. I want to try this thing on before I get to the binding and all the crazy stuff, so the tabs need to be split open so I can do that. I have a really close edge though for how these are split, so I'm going and whipping over that little bit that's left, so that way it doesn't fray out while I am trying these things on before I get the binding on. It will also help with making sure that the binding doesn't pull off of the edge, because we're going to do a very narrow binding with this. But this is the point that I got to try everything on, make sure it fit, which it does. Thankfully, I only made a couple minor adjustments, and then I can start working on the edges. And we're not going to cut the edges fully back. I'm going to cut the innermost layer of buckram back to, and in this case, that extra layer as well. I might leave a little bit over the edge in some places where it's really close to the stitching. And then I can start whipping everything down. So the seam allowances are also trimmed back as much as they need to be in order to get the curves smoothly. And then I'm whipping over and then the outside edges also get turned back and whipped over. This is what allows you to have a really narrow binding around the edge, because if you cut the edges back, the binding will just pull off. 
And honestly, the nice thing about this is it's a really fast way to temporarily finish off the edges of your stays. So if you are in a time crunch, you can simply whip back all of these edges and you're okay to wear the stays for a day or two. I wouldn't continue to do it long term, but it will work for a quick try on or a quick wear. All the edges get folded back. The only place I'm being a little bit weird about it is at the edges where I like to put a few extra stitches in to hold that. Some of it will get covered up, but not all of it. So try to make it look nice. Going around the corners, there are little pleats there and tucks there. I will make cuts as need be in the buckram layers in order to make sure that everything folds nicely, but I don't want to make any more cuts in the silk than I need to. It's lightweight enough that I don't worry about it being too bulky. And honestly, I'm more worried about things fraying and pulling out than I am about the bulk here. There might be little areas of bulk but I want to make sure that it's stable because honestly the wearing it the bulk is going to be way less obvious than if things start pulling apart. I'm doing the same thing to the top edge trimming back to where the stitch line is on that bottom layer of buckram and then trimming the other two layers about half an inch to an inch larger it just depends on the curves I need to get around. I did have to put little snips in the buckram in order to make it around those tight curves at the top but I try again not to cut into the silk if I don't have to. And these are just really big whip stitches. There's honestly no finesse to this. It just needs to hold. Once that's done, it's on to covering up the seams. This is where I'm using that Japanese silk tape for this. This isn't 100% necessary. It just looks nice to cover up those seams and it does help prevent wear a little bit as well. I'm also at this point able to make that funky little jog over at the top, which because of the boning, I can't fold things in order to do the normal whipping over the two edges. So I'm actually having to do them butted up against each other and whipping over the edge. You can see I've already done the one seam tape that's tucked in there and then I'm able to do the other seam tape for that jog that will then fold and continue down. The seam tape is very loosely stitched on. I'm just zigzagging back and forth with little tiny back stitches each time, putting a few anchors in at that corner in order to get it to turn correctly, making sure that I have one in the furthest corner of it and then folding it over and working it down. I do find that the easiest way to deal with the seam tape is to do it with the piece folded. So this part was a little bit difficult because again, I couldn't fold because of the way the boning was in that area. But once I got around that corner, I was able to fold the piece again and keep working my way down that zigzag of the edge. You don't need to catch a lot. Even just catching the whip threads is enough. It's then time to start actually binding, which Admittedly, leather can be kind of exhausting for this because it is so tough to go through. I don't recommend using a leather needle. Those have cutting edges on them. It's a little triangle in front with sharp edges. And if they cut the leather to make it easier, they also cut your fabric and that is way worse. So it may make it a little bit easier to get through the leather, but it will in the long run potentially cause damage. And I'm just doing a spaced back stitch around here, folding carefully around the lower corners. When you get to the point at the top where you're going around those those interior curves of the tabs, you want to pull it taut. Don't give yourself any extra here. The more bulk you put in, the harder it's going to be to actually shove it up inside of that turn. So you want less here, not more. More is okay for the other turns. So we're trying to keep it taut and sometimes I find it's easier to go through the fabric and then find where I'm trying to stitch through the leather piece. So it's okay to take this in two stitches if you need to definitely have a thimble on hand. I also highly recommend the needle nose pliers for pulling the needles through because it can be so tough on your hands to do this work. I wear out and I have incredibly strong hands. So definitely prepare yourself for a lot of tough work and spread it out over a few days if you can. Once I've stitched the binding down around the edge, very close to the edge, mind you, I've only got maybe an eighth of an inch here. I'm pulling it around and whipping it down to the inside. You do have to make some clips up at the top where it needs to flare out around those really tight curves at the top of the tabs. Only a few whip stitches to hold everything down in place. And then we're in the home stretch. I'm going to be bouncing back and forth on the binding a lot just because it is such a strenuous thing on the hands. And instead I'm going to take a break and start working on the center front. 
there is a split here that needs to be filled in. I need a piece of fabric and a piece of buckram, then a busk, which is made out of a half round reed that I've carved down a little bit. I'll have another piece of buckram on top of that to cover it up. Then I have two oak splints to go for the horizontal bone, and they'll actually be encased in two layers of buckram across that center front. So I chose to go with these because I experimented with other things like leather. It was just way too soft when it was cut down. The reed was really good. It's a little bit flexible, but pretty solid. I did need to soak it and re-bend it the opposite way, as well as carve it down to more of a triangle at the bottom and flatter at top. And then the oak splints that had a pretty good amount of give. Uh, I just ended up with two of them to make up the width. So the first step was to take those little triangles of fabric and whip them down in. I made sure that it was open as much as I wanted it to be, that it was a pretty even opening. It doesn't need to flare out so much as just be an open triangle, and I whipped those into place near the edge. Next up, I started to put in the busk. I generally wouldn't recommend this as the next step, but I'll get to that in a minute. The busk in this case is triangular down at the bottom, and a lot of originals have a hump there, which says to me that it's very tightly worked over. One of the originals I could find images for has thread that runs back and forth across in order to pull in the center front down at the bottom around this triangular shape. So that's what I'm starting with, anchoring it pretty well once I get up to the top of the seam there, and you can see it has a really nice ridge to it. This is pretty common in a lot of stays I'm finding, so I do wonder how much is hidden in there that we don't really look for. I'm adding another piece of buckram on top of it that'll be pretty loosely stitched. This will help to keep it in place up at the top just because I'm not going to be binding it across in the same way, so I'm worried about it shifting back and forth. This will only be stitched through the layers that it needs to be in order to be anchored down, not through that final layer of silk where it would be visible. There will be ribbon that goes around that area, so it technically wouldn't be, but the original, enough of it's worn away that you can't see any stitches there, so I assume that I shouldn't be putting stitches in a visible place. I am anchoring the top and the bottom as well. Some originals, there's a hole in the busk and they stitch through that, but I'm just trying trying this method out. It goes all the way down to the bottom and stops about half an inch or so from the top. It seems pretty well anchored in there. Like I said, it has a little bit of a curve bowing out towards the front. You can see the stitches technically don't really show through aside from a little bit at the bottom there uh, and a couple that I kind of accidentally stitched, but it's fine. Then I'm getting to the eyelets. I wish I would have done this before I put the busk in. I originally thought I was going to have to go through the fabric of the busk as well, but I found out I don't need to in most cases, and I just pulled it to the side where I had it in the way. So definitely do the eyelets first. They only have four stitches per eyelet. They're really fast. They're really small. I'm not going to be lacing and unlacing this, so they don't need to be terribly usable. Just open enough to get a ribbon through one time, and it will remain there theoretically forevermore. So these are really small, really close together, but very simple and quick for that reason. And I'm going through all of the layers of the fronts of the stays, as well as that triangle that's sitting in front, so that way those connect together, and then the ribbon can actually spiral around the busk, so the busk does need to go in before you put the ribbon in, and that will spiral around. I just had to keep making sure that it was laying flat as I was going, it wasn't twisting, and that I gave enough space, so that way when it was pulled open in the end by the binding and being on the body, that it would not be holding it too far closed. So did take a little bit of patience and surprising amount of time to get that done. Next up I had the horizontal bones. I chose to go with two because I didn't have anything that was wide as the original was, so two kind of makes up that width. I made sure that they were no longer than where the boning stopped up at the armpits, so that half inch on either side that wasn't boned definitely didn't want to go too far into that. And I took two strips of buckram, stitched down the middle, and made sure how much I needed to get over those chunky pieces of oak, and then stitched two channels on either side of the center as well. Then I could put in the oak bones, which were already curved how I needed them to be, but I did wet them down a little bit to get the curves a little closer. And once those are in, I've double checked that everything was the right length before I finished it off, that it was going to pin in place correctly, and then I stitched over the edges. I just folded over the fabric. In some originals there's an extra patch on top of it. If the fabric you're using isn't really strong enough to hold those in, maybe another patch over the end would be helpful here. I just folded it over, whipped it down, and then whipped down the ends to the pair of stays to anchor that as well. 
the key here is making sure that the ends are really anchored throughout the rest of the body it's just kind of holding it in place in fact there are originals that have just little pockets at the end that the bones sit into and those are the only parts that are actually stitched to the stays so it's the ends that are really essential here hence why the rest of it is just done with a really giant zigzag stitch in a really heavy linen thread so that way it's not going to shift up or down but doesn't need to really be anchored in any other way. I did find I had to separate my stitches on this and go through the boning channel and then go through the stays and then back up again because angles that I was working with that it was just impossible to make it in one smooth swoop. Once that was in I went back to binding which this is such a tedious process, but I managed to get the top edge bound going all the way across the center front, up around the straps, and back to the backs, which, oh, this was literally done the last second of the last day, and I am wrecking my hands by this point, but I am nearly finished. The very last thing that I am doing as of this point is taking care of the eyelets for the straps. There's one on either end of the straps, as well as a little eyelet anchored in the front where you can see it sort of scoops up. I'm not dealing with the lining today just because I don't have the time. So the lining will be made out of a white linen. As you can see, the tabs are done separately and the body is done in just a couple of pieces, just felled over on the edges. 